second delay that supposed to happen so for those 30 seconds i'm freaking out and just double checking if i have not messed up anything <laughs> looks good i'll quickly make sure we live and then get started Awesome, I can see myself, which means we're live. Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us on a Friday. As you can see, my hands are shaking again, which means I'm, I'm being joined by the absolute Kaggle legend, Chris Theod. Chris, thank you so much again for joining me on, for the third time, I believe, on the series. Oh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I always enjoy being on your show. <laughs> You're too kind. I want to introduce you by showing your profile to the audience. I, I don't know anyone who would need an introduction uh but still i'll for anyone who's been living under rock under the uh, rock chris is number 1 in notebooks category number 1 in discussion globally that's on kaggle he's in the top 12 in competition and he was also the former number 1 datasets grandmaster as you can see it's all yellow it's all golden because he's a 4x kaggle grandmaster he's a grandmaster across all categories and he's kindly agreed to share his sixth pollution uh, sixth position solo gold solution with us so we'll be diving into that um as a reminder to everyone the usual structure in this series is i introduce the guest we ask some questions around their journey uh, then we understand the competition and i request them to share a walk through of the solution and you're always welcome to ask any questions please uh, keep keep them coming in the chat and i'll keep asking them to chris Chris, like I mentioned, is a Forex Kaggle Grandmaster. He works on data science and research problems at NVIDIA. Last time I spoke to him, we talked about the Rexis competition, which is a recommender system competition, and you all would know him from Kaggle, where he's also been working on incredible problems. So, Chris, I want to start by asking, where does this awesome passion of yours come from? Kag, come for Kaggle from? because every time i speak to you you're always so passionate energetic about kaggle you're always very energetic on kaggle forums as well where, where does that come from thanks it just it's the feeling you get when you when you're doing what you're meant to be doing i i think ever since i was young i just love data i remember there was a story i was 4 years old and i was in a store and we were buying a new baseball or maybe i was 5 years old we were buying a new baseball bat and the and, and my, i was there with my parents and we said we want a new bat and they said well oh we need the numbers off your old bat and my mom my parents said oh we don't have that with us maybe we can come back and i said oh i know that and i just immediately stated the all the numbers on the baseball bat the serial number the size all the numbers so my whole life i've just loved numbers i love data as a small kid i'd memorize them and growing up you know data science didn't exist and now all of a sudden the field exists so i'm just super excited to be a part of it You've also taught in the past. We we talked about this in our earlier interviews. I, I'm trying to understand how is it fulfilling to teach on Kaggle because you really teach a lot of stuff on Kaggle. Is 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 it intentional? Do you really enjoy it, or do you find it more fulfilling compared to other uh, university teaching that you used to do? So um, I do miss. So yes, I love teaching, and I and I love, and therefore I love doing it on Kaggle, and however I can. discussions notebooks and that i do miss sort of the uh the the personal interaction that you get in a classroom and 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 i and i foresee that you know someday you know i'll i'll get back working in the classroom if if you were to pick a category since you're a grandmaster in all four which which is your favorite from all four ah oh, that's a tough question okay so let's see um Oh, it's tough. I mean, I guess like I know it's sort of not data sets, um, uh, but I, uh, you know, I started out being a grandmaster in discussions and notebooks. So maybe one could say, since those are the two I sort of sought first, those are sort of what are sort of the most meaningful to me. Um, and then it's been recently, which I've I've been focusing more on competitions, uh, changing the nature of my sharing to kind of allow me to be more competitive. But I think at heart, I think at heart, I am a teacher. Um, you know, my I think my number one goal is just is it way well, is to play. I I feel that data science is is an opportunity to play. You're playing with data. You're playing with models. It's just kind of a a, a playground, 
And then furthermore, I think I just love learning. I love seeing a new data set. You get to explore it and learn it. And then learning new learning about new techniques and what have you. So I think first and foremost, um, I like to learn and teach. But I mean, I guess as a, a final disclaimer, I could add, competitions are, are so are much more exciting, right? I mean, I get so <laughs> excited. Uh, I, I like to see myself on the leaderboard or my team on the leaderboard. I, I love the last day when you when you pick your final submissions and you're you're watching the clock tick down and you're you're excited to see what you think. So that that, that kind of excitement, though, I mean. Uh, I do love that. How, how do you pick which competitions to join? Uh, CPMP John Trunchapuje shared he picks the competitions where he can learn the most. Do you follow a similar approach? Somewhat. I mean, in general, I'll gravitate towards a competition which has something new for me. So whether it be a new type of problem, a new type of data, a new technique to use. So that is my preference. I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I would not enjoy, for instance, just having a template solution, you know, that for instance, whenever there's this type of problem, I just apply this code and I win, uh, even though I could, I, I, that wouldn't be fun for me. So yeah, I guess I, I seek out new things. And uh, I, I was asking this off the record as well. How do you, how do you balance so much effort that goes into Kaggle? Because you even right now have a huge lead of 3000 points in one category. Uh, I think it's similar in notebooks. Do you ever face burnout or because Kaggle is very addictive to anyone who does it, they know. How, how do you balance that and how do you avoid burnout if at all? I get I guess I avoid burnout because I enjoy it so much. You know, people always say that if, when they work when they work really hard, if it's something you know they enjoy doing, then they're sort of have endless energy. And when it's when someone makes you do something you don't want to do, you get tired out. So I love it. Um and then, yeah, I'm on there pretty often. I guess one thing is I don't, I don't spend much time on other social media. Uh, so, yeah, so people frequently ask me, how can you spend so much time? So I think I don't spend much time on other social media. So, you know, a lot of people are posting stuff on Twitter and Facebook. I guess generally a, a lot of, you know, basically when I sort of want to reach out and, and share information, it's generally in the form of data science. And then I'll generally just pop on Kaggle and share something. So that's probably why I, I kind of stand out in the discussions and why I have so many posts. If, if other people, you know, you know, posted kind of on here as much as they did on other social media. I I, I suspect uh, some other people might have, you know, a lot a lot of posts <laughs> me too. I, I I was just highlighting this graph. This is like uh, some some software engineers' idle graph on GitHub. Uh, that's how it is for you on Kaggle as well. There was this gap which I think correlates to the June one maybe relates to Rex's competition where you were participating on that. So your energy was focused there, but you're always active, very active, as you can see on some days, a little bit less active on some other days on Kaggle. Yeah. 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 It is interesting. Yeah. yeah that's sort of what my, made my vacation. Yeah. You're right. I think this summer we were working on some, yeah, we were working on some, some uh, projects off of Kaggle. And then I think that September, that's when I had taken a vacation. Um, I was actually uh, camping in a in a, uh, a a national forest, so I I didn't even have connection <laughs> to the internet. So I, I even if I wanted to sneak sneak on at night, I couldn't. So that's why that, that one there is no activity. In in my first interview, you told me sometimes you get an idea and you're opening your eye and looking at the clock if you can get to work. <laughs> Does it is is that passion still at the same level? Do you still get? ideas at the same level and you excited to again. it is it really is i mean it's sort of embarrassing because i don't want to sound like you know I'm <laughs> addicted but I, even just last night actually i actually there was some code i was running and i wanted to see the result so i actually kind of rolled over my bed and i i accessed it on my cell phone just to check something and then i rolled back <laughs> into bed so yeah i mean it's kind of always on my mind um basically yeah yeah hopping out of bed to try an idea or, or checking the results of something in the middle of the night it's a uh <laughs> Yes, I still do that. Andrija asked, do you sleep at all during the last <laughs> week? Is, is the last week intense uh, for some? So it is intense. Um, so my whole life, so yeah, and I have, I have uh, pulled a few all, I guess it is somewhat typical to pull some all-nighters. What's really surprising, I think, in competitions is you would think, so a competition lasts for three months, right? So you would think that, you know, you could have your solution in place um, way ahead of time in school. I was never, I never waited to the last second in school. If I had an assignment, I had it done. I had it done a week before it was due a project, a report, a coding project. It was always, I had it way done. 
unfortunately on Kaggle, I've never sort of been able to do that. Cause even though I have a solution, even though our team has a, me or my, our team has a solution where we're happy with a week before, always in the last week, something emerges. For instance, in pet finder count, this is crazy. Two days before the, the competition ended, they just released a new model, this Covnex model. The paper just hit get just hit um uh, just just was released literally two days before. So the last two nights in pet comp, I basically pulled all nighters. I downloaded all the code, all the weights. I, I mean, I had to try these two models. So I had to literally uh, this Covnex model. Um, I downloaded the weights and you know it wasn't in the Tim repository. So basically I had to do all these tricks to basically import it into PyTorch and get it to work. But I, I pulled, you know, I put in some hard hours the last two days and then got it to work and my final ensemble used those. So it's this kind of thing that even up to the very last second, you have to pay attention. And that, and that story is not unique. There's another story where our team, you know, retrained all our models literally the last night. And literally it was that submission, which pushed us into gold. So I wish it wasn't like this. I wish we, you know, you could just be, <laughs> nine to five. I wish you could have your solution in place a week before and then just be sitting on your chair watching the comp end. But I find that to be competitive and to win gold, you have to work, uh, unfortunately, up until the last second. In the Rexus one, you, you told me that uh, you were waiting for the result and it came right at the end marker, I think a few minutes before the deadline. Yeah, absolutely. Because so, sometimes when you, so yeah, I mean, sometimes you actually need the results of a submission to sort of know what your strategy is or know, you know, what's your next experiment or know what submission you'll check. So yeah, in Rexis, uh, you know, it was a code competition. People are familiar with that. But furthermore, the code allowed 24 hours to run. So if, you, if you're familiar with Kaggle, if, if it's a code competition, there's usually a, a nine hour limit. So that, means you, that usually means you could submit something the night before and maybe it runs overnight. You see it in the morning. But, but in Rexis, it was 24 hours. So we had one code and we were trying to pack as many things as we can. So we were unsure whether our code would run in 24 <laughs> hours. Imagine that, a computer running for 24 hours. So we submitted something, we packed in all these models. We had a big team, everybody had made contributions and it literally was 23 hours and 45 minutes and, and the submission had not come back yet. So our code was still running. And we and and we knew this would have been our we we knew this would be our best if it only completed within 24 hours. But we were we we were sort of unsure. But luckily, we got the email within minutes. It literally <laughs> the code ran 23 hours and like you know 57 minutes, and then it finished. And we got this email saying your submission was successful, and we were cheering. And that surely that and that as we you know predicted that was our highest score, and it was our best sub, and that won the comp. Granted, some of our other subs would have also won the comp, but you know, we were able to squeeze our our best work right in. Um. <clears throat> you're you're at the level now where you really aim for the top. Uh, how how do you keep learning still? So, for example, uh, you're not active on other social. I I get a lot of my info from Twitter. Many Kaglers, I believe, do so as well. How how do you find these papers? How do you try to keep up to date with uh, the stuff, uh, research, everything? So I would say my, my biggest resource is Kaggle itself. And this is, you know, I really appreciate everybody sharing because a lot of times, for instance, the Covnex model, you know, I, I was, I was, I learned about this Covnex model. I mentioned, this is this new model that was released uh, two days before pet finder comp. I, I learned about it because somebody posted a discussion uh, um, post and then I quickly Googled and found it. Um, yeah, they're, they're the posts. So, right. So look, you can see, uh, so they came in third. So one came 14 in 14 days ago. days ago. And if you remember the competition ended 16 days ago. So somebody two <laughs> days before the comp ends and said, Hey guy, and the paper literally was released, but that's, you know, where I had learned about it. So yeah, basically reading previous reading competition solutions and reading, there's so many amazing Kagglers who share so much, you know, uh, both, both on papers and they, they dive deep into stuff. And uh, that's that's one of my biggest sources of learning new stuff. May, may I ask a stupid question? You're always so... Uh, I I want to say humble on Kaggle because you're always engaging with people like me who also ask stupid questions on there. <laughs> how do you not develop this ego? Because you're on the top of the leaderboard globally. How, how do you stay so humble? So I've thought about this because I, I have been asked this before. And I think 
I've actually learned, I've, I think I've learned in life that if you truly want to learn and if you truly want to grow, then you must be humble, right? Because the, the, the definition of growing is sort of become changing, kind of becoming something you're not, you know, learning new things. If I, you know, right now think I know everything or my way is the best, I'm never going to take the time to, to look at what someone else is saying. So, you know, you might think, oh, you know, my motivation is 100% altruistic. I, you know, I'm humble because I, and, and, I, and, and, and half it is, I, you know, I love people, I care about people, I want to help people. But to be honest, I've, I also realize that it's actually being humble. It's engaging in all of these discussions with everybody, no matter, no matter where they are. That's, that's a lot of times where I learn the most. It's amazing. I can think of some examples, but somebody might ask something that's silly, like, oh, you know, you know, why did you change this hyperparameter in the, you know, in your atom optimizer? And, you know, maybe someone else would just say, oh, that's just like what people do. But, you know, I take the time and I think, well, I know that's a simple question, but actually that's a good question. So maybe I'll dig into it a little deeper. And then all of a sudden I'll discover, oh, wait a second, there's actually two parameters in the atom optimizer. You know, maybe I thought it was one. So it's kind of like these conversations start and then by being open to them, as the conversation proceeds, it opens my eyes. I, I'll, I'll learn something I didn't realize. Or in, in, in the process of trying to explain something carefully to somebody, you realize there's something you didn't know and then you have to read up on it. So um, all questions uh, and discussions help me grow. Uh, your, your learning inspires many people like me also to learn. So we're really grateful <laughs> for that. Um, I want to transition now to talking about the competition. So uh, let me sharing. For anyone who wants to find Chris, you don't have to scroll at all. He's on the sixth position by himself. It's a solo goal. And uh, I really want to point out to the audience that's foreign to Kaggle. This is really hard to achieve. And this is one of the requirements for becoming a competitions grandmaster. And I want to ask what, what led you to the decision of just competing by yourself this time? Why, why didn't you team up? So in, in this particular comp, <clears throat> uh, it was a conscious decision. I think it was because... so there was a lot of speculation that there was going to be a huge shakeup. <clears throat> the public leaderboard was behaving very strangely. <clears throat> it was uh, acting very different than local validation. So, you know, I had my theories about the shakeup, but nonetheless, you couldn't, you couldn't ignore the fact that it was quite possible that there would be a shakeup. So that being said, um, you know, I was maybe considering team, I was maybe considering contacting some of my coworkers who are also kind of up high, but in, in the end, the reason I didn't, I didn't, I didn't contact my coworkers was I actually felt that a part of the comp was a little bit of a lottery ticket and, you know, you get two final submissions. So each team gets two lottery tickets. And I sort of thought, you know, in terms of, you know, one of my, one of my coworkers, um, uh, you know, doing, doing, you know, placing in the top, it was maybe best for us all to, you know, just work on our own stuff and not collaborate and therefore get, get sort of more lottery tickets and then a higher chance that sort of, someone you know ends at the top for the audience i want to mention there's an incredible kaggle grandmaster team at nvidia uh, that's what chris is referring to you can think of legends like cpmp jiba uh, people at the level of chris uh they're, they're at the kg mon team as they call it yeah and you can see that they did very well in the pet comp um so we actually have you know four in the top 16 or something like that you got so that's Jibba up there at number one. And then you got a uh, Anadero there in place four on his team. I'm here in six. And then you could see that a uh, CPMP was right there. Um, place eight. Just that outside was, the zone. Yeah. And that was really impressive. So he actually just started a few days before the competition ended. And he and he, actually, he made a really creative model. He did something that nobody else did. He applied ordinal regression. Um, and his single that was a single model, which jumped to 18. So if he had more time, if he ensembled it with anything, he also would have been in gold. But yeah, it's cool. When you read the solution write-ups, you can actually see um, how actually all the top solutions, everybody in the goal, they, there's many ways to approach the problem. And people all did much, a lot of different things. As I said, you know, he used a different, he used a different loss, which was quite novel. Um, some people used the, the rapids, a support, a support vector regression. Uh, some people like on Adaro, he used uh, XG boost. Some people had creative ways of using old data. So actually there was a lot of different little things. A lot of people approached the problem quite differently. And there's a, a variety of solutions at the top. 
uh, yeah, we we'd love. I'd love to dive into your solutions uh, as well. And I want to ask, what? Why did you decide to enter this competition? Uh, what what led you to signing up? And from there, I'll start diving into the data as well. I will stay on this screen right here. That right there is one reason. Look at that picture. <laughs> look at that. No, go, look at this cat. A cat. A cat taking a photo. I mean, this comp, right? I mean, the, who who doesn't want to explore data of pets? So you know, it's a really, it's a it's a super, it's a really fun comp. Um, you know, it's for a great cause. It, it it's going to help promote the adoption of animals. Looking at the data was fun. It all you know, we had tens of thousands of photos, and they're uh, all of animals. Um, uh, so in that sense, you know, it's a really, it's a really, um, <clears throat> a, 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 a great comp and it's a, the, it's a fun comp, but then I guess additionally, and, and I thought it was a great learning experience. So just recently I was sort of motivated by one of my coworkers, uh, Dieter, uh, who just took a, t- took two first places in the, in the, in the latest, uh, Google landmark competition, but he did so which the solution this year was quite different than last year, which is he used a uh, image transformer. So last year, I believe the models were image or CNNs, but this year for the first time he used a combination and actually he, he built the model architecture himself where he fused together a CNN with, with a transformer. So um, yeah, there it is. Those, both those two first places, they ended a few weeks. Um, oh, we have to scroll down. Oh yeah, the, two, the 2021 one. So it's not as, so he wanted, yeah, there it is. So you can see it ended four months ago. So it ended just before the pet finder comp. And what was super exciting about it was I'm always, I'm always excited to see new technology win a comp, right? I mean, the model he used did not exist a year ago. It was all the latest um, with, with transformers. So that was exciting. So basically the, I, was, I was motivated by all these new models in the field of, uh, of, of computer vision. So I sort of wanted to explore some. So this was my first time, uh, diving deeper into some of the transformers. I had worked with VIT before, but I had never worked with SWIN. Um, there's a BEIT. So there's some new transformers I got to use. I also played with, you know, trying to fuse uh, CNNs together with transformers. So it was kind of a, a good learning experience to really explore the new state-of-the-art models and image, which unbelievably they're changing every year, right? So that was another draw for me. May, may I ask another stupid question? So uh, someone like me first downloads the paper, I start reading the paper, then I go to the repository. If you want to learn something new, so let's say you didn't know about attention at all when you first heard of it and when you wanted to try vision transformers, how did you go about learning it? So I think the way I learn any new thing is really just getting just getting my, just get hands on. So if, if any, if, I, if I, so, you know, whether it be, a new image model. You know, I recently entered a Santa competition, which was the traveling salesman problem. I, I actually had not worked on that previously. So any new type of problem or new type of technology, the first thing I'll do is download a small example and I'll play with it. And it, it really is a, a play, a playful experience. You just try a little example. You look at the outcome. You maybe you compare it to some things that you've done previously, compare a transformer to a CNN, uh, start seeing the differences. For example, one of the, one of the, earliest things I noticed when comparing image transformers to CNNs and, and um, somebody uh, made a post in the pet finder comp was how the models, if, if they're trying to classify or, or regress an image, the models really pay attention to different things. So there's a thing called this uh, grad cam where when a, when a model makes a prediction, you can actually highlight the part of the image that was used in making the decision. And if you actually apply grad cam on a CNN and pet finder comp, you would actually notice that the CNNs, so a CNN actually looks at, at, at clusters of, lo- of local features. So it kind of looks, it, it, it kind of like zooming in. And if you notice, the CNNs would actually look at the animal face and it would sort of make the decision on whether this is a popular animal based on the face. Now, if you did the grad cam on the image transformer, the image transformer does a better job of collecting global features around the whole image and sort of utilizing all of them. It, it doesn't sort of look for it does better globally. And if you looked at the grad cam, what that, what you actually saw was that the image transformer was actually looking at the entire posture, the whole body position of the animal. So was the animal facing the camera? Was the animal turning sideways? So you look, you, so this, and this, this emerges just from playing around, you know, nobody said you need to use grad cam, but if you're playing at it with a new model, why not use the new model? You know, look at its grad cam, look at, you know, it's training times. Just do everything you're used to, and just kind of see how it's different than what you've previously done. 
I, I think it again boils down to your true passion because you love tinkering on Kaggle and you love to learn that way. Yeah, tinkering. That's a good word, actually. I love tinkering. And then, it, yeah. <laughs> um, coming back to the competition, uh, and again, shout out to Dieter, who's a retired <laughs> construction worker turned Kaggle. <laughs> uh, coming, coming to the competition, I want to explain the problem to the audience. So please correct me, Chris, I'm wrong. I'm, I'll, I'll try to do an okay job of explaining it. Uh, we were supposed to predict a popularity score, and that would tell the organization pet finder how easy it is to set a pet up for adoption so their mission is to send pets for adoption and they have a nice website their end goal is to find a score and optimize for it so that they can get more pets adopted um and inside of the uh, training data set you had some metadata i participated in the previous one i don't think this was there we were trying to calculate this manually but this time they they actually tell you if the pet is in focus if their eyes are both facing front uh, or one eye is detected all of these metadata was there and uh, i i think chris will dive into how this played into his solution and of course there were different images of different pets that had the corresponding metadata Anything that I missed here in the problem statement? I, I did no, a bad job, but still. No, no, you summed it very well. Actually, I could even suggest if you click on discussion, let's see, go to, click on discussion and then maybe, uh, okay, so and then so let's scroll down slowly. Let's see, I'm looking for, there's something about upload your pet photos. Keep slow, scrolling down. I remember it. I can search for it. <laughs> uh, it's on this page. It's on this page or, or you can search for it. Yeah, share this. So then scroll down. This kind of sums the comp. Now scroll down here. Uh, okay, yeah, these little pictures. So here's some examples, right? So yeah, so the comp was, so if you scroll down a little bit more, we can see uh, eight pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, yeah, your model had to take the image of the pet and then it would predict this top thing, which is the pop, pop, popularity score, which is roughly <laughs> basically saying uh, how likely the, the photo will be clicked. And this, this would be helpful because if we can figure out, you know, which photos get clicked, we obviously want animals to get adopted so we can basically essentially help choose better photos, which the audience likes. And you, and you can kind of see with your eye here. So these top eight um, all have high popular uh, popularity scores. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give a, a shout out in the bottom row. That's uh, that's my parents, pet Stella there. They are the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the French bulldog there um, who, who did who got a good popularity score. And then if you scroll down a little bit, um, you said these, so all these eight are ranked actually in order. So those top eight scored better scores than the low eight. And already with your eye, you can see a difference, right? So I the top eight, you know, the, the animal sort of centered in the middle of the picture, uh, and the bottom eight, you know, it's more distractions. The animal, the animal is not the focus of the picture, but and sure enough, these scores here are what, are what, a, um, um, actually these scores were generated by, by my model. And you could see how, you know, the model recognizes that, you know, photos that are sort of centered on the animal and the animal is smiling. They, uh, they yeah, these top photos get clicked more. You can see that the animals is more focused. The animal is smiling and the bottom photos, it's kind of harder to see the animal and these photos would get clicked less. This is just one observation, but you know, this is the, this is the benefit of this competition. It'll help people understand, you know, which photos are sort of helping the pets get adopted. And then it could help us say, uh, you know, take and, and choose better photos and get more more pets adopted. Awesome. Uh, that makes sense. So when you first saw this competition, how did you set up a baseline? What was your first thought? I'm trying to understand how did you first, when you saw the problem, what were your first thoughts? How did you approach the competition? Okay, so I kind of approach <clears throat> every competition the same, which is you got to set up a reliable uh, local validation, which means, you know, <clears throat> totally independent of the leaderboard, you know, without the leaderboard, you need a way of building a model and then essentially evaluating how well the model is doing. Uh, and this is called cross validation. So I did that. What's interesting is this was always a topic of debate in this competition because this met, so this competition, the metric was a uh, um, root mean squared error, which it's an image regression task, which actually is not, it's not, you know, super common. A lot of times they do more classification tasks. So, a bunch of people, uh, or, it, or it's very easy, you know, when computing the local metrics, there's very easy ways to sort of um, compute it incorrectly. So for example, if, if we just had an accuracy metric or some other metric, you know, you can compute the metric for each individual batch 
and then just mm. kind of average the batches and that can give you one score. But since ultimately the metrics a square root, you know, you can't, you can't compute the metric on individual batches because the average of many square roots is not itself a square root. So there was some subtle, there was some, there was actually some subtleties in setting up your local val, local CV correctly. And I think this really made a difference on, on how you placed, because for instance, there was some discussion posts and people said, you know, I have a local validation score of 15. So that is phenomenal. Like 15, you know, you would blow away the competition. But I believe the only way it's possible is there was sort of a, there was potentially an error in the computation. So um, if you read a lot of the winner's solution posts, um, basically the best models were achieving local validations around 17. And I think the best team maybe got it low to, as low as 16.8. So, that, so if you set up your local validation correctly, that's the scores you should have been getting. If you were seeing things like 15 and that much lower, then there was sort of a problem. So <clears throat> this is just a roundabout way of describing the importance of why you have to really, really set up your local validation and make sure it's computing the, the score correctly. Because at that point, moving forward in the competition, you just keep exploring ideas and just and just evaluating them and just picking the ones that give you the, the best local validation score. That makes sense. You also actively look, look at discussions because I saw in your solution, you pointed out there were leaks in some kernels that people had shared. How do you decide when to look at kernels? I know CPMP, he follows the approach where he looks at them later, not to bias his approach. I, that might have changed since the last time I spoke with him. Do you follow a similar strategy? Yeah, in general, in general, I'll approach a new problem and I'll, I'll do it completely on my own for a week or two without looking at anything. That way I can, you know, have an unbiased, uh, I can kind of find my own approach, which is unbiased by things I hear. Uh, and then after I get to a point where I'm sort of have something decent, a lot of times I'll look online and see how it's comparing to what others are doing. And I'll look at some other approaches. That's my general strategy. Of course, it deviates a lot. You know, in this competition, my strategy was actually quite different. I would say that I would say that the biggest theme in this competition was how 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 weird the public leaderboard was. I mean, the public leaderboard was the best teams were only getting a public leaderboard of seventeen point five, whereas you know accurate CVs were getting as low as sixteen point eight. So there was this huge gap, almost a one gap, and. It actually is a very, very big gap. If you do some statistical analysis locally, yeah. So let, let's just let's check the pro, the public leaderboard. You can see the top score is seventeen five. Now click the button for the private leaderboard. You got sixteen point eight. That's a, a really huge difference. huge difference. And if you do a statistical analysis, actually, um, that difference only occurs one in a hundred thousand or something. It's actually very, very rare. It, it, it turns out that something very rare happened here the particular data that was chosen for the public leaderboard, if it came from the same distribution as all the data, it was a very rare subset. And I did some analysis early on. And since it was so rare, I was actually questioning whether it came from the same, um, whether the photos came from sort of the same distribution. I, like many others, was wondering if there was something fishy with the test data and if there would be a huge shakeup. Okay, all that being said, that changed my approach to the problem because there was this huge unknown factor between, you know, what will our final score be and, and, and can we trust local validation? And whenever I see a huge unknown factor like this, my general strategy is to move towards an ensemble because that protects you. Um, you know, I could spend all day building one model and achieve an amazing CV score on one model and maybe the leaderboard score is not so good, but I feel that's like putting all your eggs in one basket. If something fishy is going on, maybe that one model won't do so good. But when you explore an ensemble, that means you're trying out a whole bunch of different models and, you know, you, you try to make each one the best it can be. And yeah, and then you can use a technique called hill climbing. And the advantage of this is this protects against funny business or, or mystery in CV and LB. And when you do an approach like this, usually this is when I'll, I'll this is another, this is usually frequently I'll join a team. This is the best time to have a team. Because as an individual, it's very hard to make a diverse set of models because everybody has their preferences, the ways they like to do things, like the way general hyperparameters they use, models they use, styles. You know, it's very hard as a single individual. 
So in this competition, I actually depended heavily on public notebooks. I actually read nearly every public notebook. And I, I oh. yes, I, I read nearly every every public notebook that that was, you know, had had people voted up and it did well. And I actually I investigated each one. <clears throat> I downloaded nearly every one and I optimized <clears throat> I optimized every one. So frequently, this is sort of why I discovered a lot of errors in the in the in the uh, in their CVs. Most public notebooks had errors in how they computed CVs. I had to correct many of them, not just the ones I, I point out already, but there were others. So I would download them. I'd fix the CV. I would retune the model. I'd change a lot of things. And I would push each model to what I thought was the best. So it, to my, my, end, my final ensemble in this solution was you know, a few of my own models. But I actually used, <clears throat> I used a lot of versions of many other people, of many public notebooks. And again, it was to protect myself against this sort of mystery. And um, I mean, a similar thing happened in Melanoma Comp. There was sort of a mystery and, and sort of a very diverse ensemble uh, held out on top. I was just shitting the ensemble that you did. <laughs> yeah, so that's the best CV. You can see all those different models. And actually, if you look at my best LB ensemble, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see I even did some other ones. So I, I, I even added <clears throat> two more CNNs, this dense net, and that came from a public notebook. And then this inception also came from a public notebook. Um, and actually even efficient net, it started with, uh, with Robin's public notebook, but then I made some changes. I, he, he originally had used a cat boost um, as a stage two model. I, I changed that over to rapids uh, support vector regression. That actually gave me a pretty good boost um, in the, both the CV and the LB. I did some other changes, but you can see um, it was a huge diversity of models. Uh, there's a question in the chat and as a reminder to the audience, please uh, keep asking the questions in the YouTube chat. I'll, I'll, I'm actively looking at them. That's why you see my head rotating. Uh, but uh, the question is, what is your training setup? And I'd love to extend that. How do you manage your ideas? How do you track your experiments? And uh, is uh, do, you, do you set up a Docker environment? Do you use Anaconda? Because I'm always bombing my NVIDIA CUDA setup and I have to reinstall it every time. <laughs> I see. So I'm actually, um, I'm actually very old school. So I actually, I use a, a pencil and paper and you can see those are my experiments. Those are some of the metrics. I've just got pages and pages of numbers, um, Whoa. pages of more numbers, pages of more numbers. I might've gone through, I don't know, 40, 50 pages and I just, just keep writing it all down. So it's sort of old school. It's not, it's not the most efficient thing. Um, I've been, people have told me about, you know, these, there are some, you're right. There's, I've heard of weights and biases. There's a, there's a bunch of public ways to actually <clears throat> keep track of all the experiments and they have the advantage of, of, of showing you, you know, plots and, and some analytical tools, which could be helpful. And maybe one day I'll switch over, but I've always been kind of a, a hands again, you know, I talked about hands on earlier. W what's more hands on than using this pencil, right? So I'm kind of a hands on guy. Um, so that's kind of what I do. So yeah, so as for experiments, um, <clears throat> I have lots of ideas. I'm running them all. I'm, 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 I'm looking at, I'm constantly making note of the CV scores. I'm also blessed to be working with NVIDIA. So um, as a senior data science at, at, at NVIDIA, you know, you know NVIDIA <laughs> makes the GPU, right? So the company has computers. So I have, I have access to computers. So specifically, um, I usually always have that. So I specifically, I have access to um, a DGX st station, which has four V100 GPUs. So that's, that's reserved for me, which, so basically I can always access that. And if I want, I could put in requests to try to get more machines and based on availability, I could potentially get more, but um, I may or may not do that. In this comp, for instance, you know, I, I, I just use my DGX um, and people said, how do you balance experiments? So I, you know, I'm lucky to be working with a wonderful company and have access to GPUs. So you know, that, that has four GPUs. So you know, I can just take an experiment and I throw it onto one GPU and you know, I might run it overnight and that's fine. I still have three more GPUs because you know, I do, uh, um, so I, you know, in video, of course I do more than just Kaggle. So I'm working on a lot of other projects, both internal, I, building models, analyzing data, and that requires GPUs. So, you know, in my DGX, maybe a couple of my GPUs, I have to work on my other work, but I usually have some free GPUs. And I would say at pretty much at all hours of the day, 
uh, I, I'm basically, even right now, for instance, I'm in a couple competitions. And as we speak, those GPUs are running and I'm running experiments. I always have some GPUs running experiments. When this call ends, I'll check on the results. I'll grab my pencil here. I'll add <laughs> <it to> my <laughs> notebook. <laughs> I'm I'm very grateful to Nvidia. They also sent me an A6000, which is there in my machine. Although I don't nearly put it to as any good use as as you do. So I just have good things to say about Nvidia. Uh, coming back to the questions, there's another uh, one from the audience that fits in. Uh, what's your recipe to train neural networks? Any specific steps or uh, methods that you follow? Okay. So neural networks are fun to train. So they actually remind, so training a neural network reminds me of being a teacher um, in the sense of <laughs> training a neural network is like training students. Um, you know, there's not, one technique doesn't work for all. Um, you have to sort of understand your students. You have to periodically stop and look at their progress. Uh, and depending on, you have to sort of, you have, so you have to frequently look at, you know, what are they, so that, you know, a frequent evaluations and in school, a teacher will give a, a quiz or an exam to see if the students are learning stuff and modify instruction. You have to do a similar thing with neural networks. You know, you train a neural network, you then have to look at its predictions and you'll be surprised. You know, it, there was this other competition. Uh, it was the SETI competition. You had to look at, um, uh, there was a, um, you had wave signals and you had to determine if it was, it was a classify as either an alien signal or not. Well, everybody converted it. Everybody's using neural networks. They converted it to an image um, and then they trained it. Well, what you noticed was if you trained, um, if you trained, if you trained your neural network and then you stopped and you, and you evaluated the neural network with grad cam, you actually learned that the neural network was paying attention to the background. So imagine an image, which there's a bunch of noise and what have you, because it's, it's basically all of the all of the sort of wave signals in the air, which is just sort of noise. And there might be one strong white line, which represents some signal we're searching for. But yeah, oh, great. Wow, you're good at finding posts. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's grad cam, right? So you can actually see what, you know, what's, what's grad cam learning. And in these cases, this is good. So in this situation, this plot shows that the, that the model is actually looking at the signal. Those little lines are indeed the uh, alien signal, the fake alien signal. Um, and this is good. Now, this is the result of training um, with mix-up. So mix-up constantly, you know, takes, it, it cuts, you know, it, it takes multiple images and cuts a piece of one image, um, or sorry, no, it actually blends two images uh, together. And the advantage is it's sort of, um, it, it basically, if you have a signal in one image and a different background in another image, then it essentially blends them and then it, it superimposes this signal on this background. So when you train with mix-up, you actually start to randomly change the background. So the model can no longer pay attention to background. Well, anyway, if you do grad cam on a model that was trained without mix-up, you'll actually notice the model actually starts looking at the background and not the signal. You know, it says, oh, you know, a, a frequent a, a, a example uh, commonly used is there was a thing where they were classifying dogs and cats. And the cats were sitting on pictures of cars and the dogs were, um, say, sitting on a picture of a boat. A weird example, right? And then you train your model. And the model was achieving 99% accuracy. Well, what was the model doing? Whenever the model saw a car, it said cat. Whenever the model saw a boat, it said dog. The point is the model was looking at the background, not, not the actual animal. And, and you only, so is the long answer for how do you train a neural network. But you have to, you have to periodi periodically check to see what is your neural network learning? Is your neural network learning the signal or is it learning a spurious background? And what mistakes is it making? Look at, look at the OOFs. What mistakes does it make? What does it get good? So you sort of, you have to, just like working with a student, you have to analyze how your neural network's doing and then that will inform you how to train the, train the cha tr change the training. If it's focusing too much on the background, let's do something to remove that. If it's, um, if it's not, if it's making a whole bunch of errors every time the image is blue, well, let's consider, um, you know, some data augmentation, changing the color. So you basically look at its mistakes the same way you'd work with a student and then think, how could you, how could you change the training process so that, you know, you'll avoid these mistakes and that it'll, it'll do more of what it's doing that's good. 
I wanted to point out an example of this. So you can do something called channel shuffle, where it basically changes the color and an RGB shift. Uh, basically, what Chris was saying. Yeah, yeah. These are very these are very effective techniques. So that was sort of a high level of how you train a neural network. Obviously, there are small choices of just hyperparameters, learning rates, batch sizes, and there I just kind of file fi follow a standard procedure. You know, pick a few, look at your local validation score. And then, you know, try, try a few different learning rates, maybe go twice as large, half as large, try a few learning schedules. So I, I just sort of do somewhat of a, you know, in, in a formed grid, grid search, you just a little trial and error, um, and then just kind of find hyperparameters that way. But you still have to observe the high level of your neural network. That's how you're gonna win gold medals. You have to understand what is your neural network doing well? What is it doing poorly? And how can I train, change the training? Maybe it's state augmentation. Maybe it's, you know, uh, cut mix or mix up. Maybe it's, maybe it's um, uh, you know, uh, changing the sample weights. Maybe it's not seeing the signal because only, maybe it's not finding the fraudulent credit card transaction because only 0.1% are fraudulent. So we need to upsample. I mean, you have to sort of see what it's doing and not doing and then sort of change the training procedure. That makes sense. Thank, thank you for that answer. Now I'd love to transition into your solution. So if you could share a highlight of it uh, or talk around the solution, that would be awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, maybe I'll just have you, if you, since you have already set up a share a screen, maybe you could just pull up sure. my, my solution there. Uh, I have a discussion post. We can just work from there. <clears throat> oh, great, great. Yeah, we'll just, so let's just do that. So I'll, we'll just, I'll just ask you to scroll. So we'll start here. Yeah, so we already discussed, so okay. So here's the comp. We already discussed sort of my motivation for joining. I think it's a, I think it's a, a really great comp, helpful uh, for pets. It's a, it's a fun comp. Um, early on, uh, we already discussed, uh, I, I noticed that there was, so the very first step I do in every comp is I build a local validation. And then maybe actually, if you can scroll down a little, I think, uh, perfect, perfect, right there. Um, yeah, so the very early on, I just set up a local validation. I start computing some scores. And actually one of the earliest things you do in a competition is you need to make a submission. And that'll show you, you know, is the public leaderboard score the same as your local validation? And in this comp, it was not. So in some comps, so currently I'm also in this, um, uh, it's an it's a NLP comp uh, with student writing. Mm -hmm. And it's turning out that the CV score and the LB score are literally one and the same. So some comps, you compute a local CV, you submit it. I mean, I if I increase my CV by 0 0.001, the LB in that comp, 0 0.001. I mean, it's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. So that's an ideal situation. But you need to know what you're dealing with. So in this comp, I make a submission, and right away, there was a big difference. And then if you want to explore that, you can do some statistical analysis to see if the difference, if the distance is, is explained by, you know, the leaderboard um, being a subset or is the difference explained by the leaderboard is potentially different data. That's an important thing to evaluate. If you think the test data is different than your training data, you approach the competition different than if you think the test data comes from the same distribution of the train data. That is super, super important. I will stress that. Early on in the comp, you need to discover that. That changes the whole way you approach the comp. And in this comp, it was unclear from the get-go. There was evidence to support that the test data may actually be different than the training data. And that's why I told you early on, I sort of went with the root of an ensemble to a, uh, and you know, through LB probing, I tried to sort of explore the nature of the difference. I didn't get too far, but I did, I did decide to go ensemble. <clears throat> So is, is there ever a doubt when you're selecting some model? That's oh, no, absolutely a doubt. I, I almost, <laughs> at, the, at the last second, I almost unselected that one. The reason is, you might say, well, Chris, you're always saying trust your CV. You're, people <laughs> say I'm a big advocate. Why would I doubt? I'll tell you why I doubt. You trust your CV when you believe the test data is the same as the training data. In that situation, your CV is the absolute best choice. Now, if you think that Kaggle has used a different test data than the training data, like let's say the test data had no pictures of dogs and cats. Let's say the test data, we can't see the test data, it's hidden. Let's say the test data is all pictures of hamsters and um, pet turtles. <laughs> so 
if the test data is radically different than the training data, you have to start trusting the LB because at that point, the leaderboard score becomes more meaningful because the local validation score is on the dogs and cats. So you have to sort of make that decision call. And also there's an in-between. Some people, you've heard of a formula. You take your leaderboard score, multiply by 20%, you know, plus your CV score, multiply by 80%, and you find the model that maximizes that. So in this comp, I did some analysis and I actually somewhat believed that there was something fishy with the leaderboard. And that being said, I almost chose two different best LB subs. Um, I had another LB sub, which was ranked 40th. Um, I felt it was highly diverse for my other LB sub. And I almost chose those two. Had I done that, I would not have gotten gold. So, <laughs> and part of the reason was I said, you know, this, there's something strange going on here. But hey, I'm always tell people and trust your CV. I can't, you know, do that, lose, and then all of a sudden do a discussion post and say, hey, guys, you know, just like you all, I couldn't do it. So I kind of, in the end, stuck with the CV because I'm advocating that. And once again, you know, it's never, it's actually never let me down. So I'm glad I did. <laughs> it's for, for newbies or like people like me who have a vague idea but are not good at it, how, how can we set up a good CV? Um, so the, def the, the base, the, the de facto, the default CV is something called the craft across validation, which is, you know, you, you're given training data and then you got to split it into folds. So really the only decision, you know, you have to make locally is sort of how you break up the folds. And this, you have to be careful of, you know, if there's users involved or if certain test data is related to other test data, then you want to keep all of those examples, say, together in the same fold. That's something called a, a group fold. There's also things like stratified. I, personally, I think it's a little bit overused on Kaggle. Um, it, it's particularly useful if you have rare targets. You know, For instance, let's say a target only occurs. Let's say you're doing a, a, multi, a multi-label uh, problem, and one of the targets only occurs you know, 0.1%, so they're very, very infrequent. Well, you want to make sure that every fold has at least some of them. And then you use the stratification and that forces that every fold has some. But when, when a target is, you know, is, is, is when you have, you know, 50% positive, 50% negative, there's no need to stratify. You just do a, a random split. It's fine. So you have to kind of decide how to make your folds. And then from that point, um, and then of course, you know, make sure that you're computing your metrics correctly and what have you. Uh, each competition has a metric. Some metrics are very confusing. Uh, for instance, in this uh, new, uh, this new, uh, object detection. It's the Great Barrier Reef one. The metric is quite confusing. It's the average of F2 scores over a range of IOUs. So you have to make sure that you implement it correctly. So make sure very carefully that you implement it. And then once you set up your folds, once you implement the metric, um, that's that's pretty much, uh, yeah, if you go to the evaluation page here, you can see, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, you look. So it's very complicated, right? It's evaluated on F2 score at different intersections. So they're evaluated every 0.05. So that means uh, that means there's 20 evaluations between 0.3 and 0.8. So mm -hmm. it actually computes 20 different F2 scores and then averages them. And then each one's pretty complicated. You know, they set an IOU threshold. So it's pretty elaborate. So you have to make sure that you implement it correctly. Um, and then, a, uh, then you have your local validation. <clears throat> That makes sense. So, sorry for keep, uh, I, I keep going on tangents, but I have these burning questions that I want to ask. Um, right. So you set up your, your validation. Then I'll, then I, uh, if you scroll down the next one, so this was the next, so there's some big, big things in this comp. This was not discussed very heavily, but this was pretty huge actually. So if you go to the pet finders website, all of the images are square, but the data they gave you are rectangles, right? So you want to train your model to basically your model, you want your model to see the images as they are on the website, because that's what users are seeing. So there wasn't too much discussion. So one thing people noticed that fast AI was doing very, very good in this competition. Um, yeah, here's the website. You see all of them are square. Also, let me point out, not only are they square, they're not distorted, right? If you take a rectangular image mm. and you smush it to a square, you would see a cat with a very thin head. These cats and dogs don't have thin heads. <laughs> <laughs> so these are not these are not squished squares. These are cropped squares. They take a rectangle and they cut out a square. So that's these two pictures. In the bottom pictures, 
it's when I take, I, you take the dog image and you cut out the middle square. In the top image, you take a rectangle and you just resize it. So most people didn't discuss this until there was a few, most people didn't discuss this, but people pointed out how fast AI was performing fantastic. Part of the reason fast AI, and you, if you want to go to a, a notebook here, you can scroll down a little bit. There's a link, uh, or you can go to the, you can go to the code. Like you can go to the code section and find the highest voted code. Mm -hmm. um, so just sort by votes. Or, and then uh, here we go. Pet finder, uh, fast AI starter. So it's one of the most popular uh, notebooks. And let's scroll down to their data loader. So scroll down to the data loader. Sorry, I wanted to mention, a, I wanted to give a shout out to Tanishk. He's 18 years old. He's doing his PhD. He's an absolute prodigy. He completed his master's at the age of 16. He He's a legend. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, this this notebook was very helpful to me. This was one of the, early, one of the first notebooks I used. Super helpful. If you, grow, and if you grow, scroll down, keep scrolling down to the data loader. Scroll down more. I was trying to click on model training. It's not jumping this. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, right here, right here, right here. Okay. <laughs> so here's the fast AI data loader. And you notice they use something called, you see, they resize. So most people didn't realize this. This is not the same as PyTorch or Albumtations resize. This is not the same as TensorFlow resize. When fast AI says resize, they mean crop. If you look at the explanation of the resize, they actually, not only is it a crop, it's a random crop. So resize will actually randomly, uh, yeah, let's see if we can see it here. So size and then, uh, so let's scroll down. Oh wait, random crop. No, these are the, these are their, uh, these are their. Um, I, I think the first one is what you're looking for. It just crops into the center. Oh but, yeah, yeah, um, that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, that's so that's what, yeah, exactly. That's a good example. Yeah. So when 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 fast AI says resize, what they're actually doing is they're doing a random max square crop. So when the photo is a rectangle, then every time it's actually choosing it's choosing the largest square because it, it by default mains, maintains aspect ratio. It chooses the largest square. It randomly picks one and then resizes to 224, right? That's pretty involved. It says one word resize, but it's actually doing random maximum square crop. That's actually, so not only is it resizing, it's already performing data augmentation, right? You're, each time each time you choose that Im image, you're gonna get a different square. Maybe one time your square instead of right, you only, you know, you get more of the dog's head. So this was a huge reason that fast AI was performing so well. And you could, and you know, people tried to duplicate, people tried to cha train the, uh, the, the SWIN transformer with PyTorch, they were not duplicating the results. It wasn't until later in the last few weeks that one, of the, one user published the Py, PyTorch notebook that actually, that actually mimicked the fast AI performance. And the reason they, the, the way they were able to accomplish that is they actually correctly um, did this uh, data loader. You know, the, instead of squishing the image, they did random square crops. And then this technique improves all models. For example, when I would download, you know, other CNN models, one of the first thing I ch changed is I changed the resize line to a random crop. And that immediately boosted all the CVs because, I mean, yeah, I mean, look how funny that top image looks. So we, I mean, <laughs> you know, who, who's going who's gonna to click on that skinny dog, right? That, I'm not, so, yeah, if you, if you squeeze the images, they're not going to be clicked on. So, you know, getting the getting the pre-process to correct was 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 pretty key in this comp, and and help really help the models. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, continuing further. Um... Yeah. So the next thing, as I said earlier, I was inspired by uh, Dieter's uh, win in Landmark, where he used both uh, both the uh, convolutional neural networks and image transformers. So likewise, I wanted to use both here. So I didn't end up fusing them together. It turned out in this comp that sort of simple models were doing be be better um, and actually low resolutions were doing very, very good. I mean, the idea is, you know, I think, you know, the reason someone clicks an image of a dog, it's not because when you zoom in on all these tiny, tiny pixels, you know, <laughs> you see that their dog tag is silver and not red. You know, I think it's, it's very high level. You could take the image and just blur it out and, 
basically people made high level decisions. Maybe what color is the dog? You know, whether it's a dog or a cat, what's the position? Is the face close up? I actually don't think you need, you didn't need very, very high resolution. And therefore you didn't need very powerful models that did all sorts of fancy stuff. So that being said, I ended up not fusing the CNNs with, with the image transformers. Nonetheless, though, each did provide a different perspective of looking at the uh, image and both did contribute to the solution. I was able to, um, you know, get CNNs to perform equally as transformers, which was a difficult thing to do. Many people weren't. One of the ways to help was we talked about getting the pre-process. No one actually trained any CNNs with correctly squ squared images. Like, well, someone probably did, but a lot of the popular notebooks, you know, squished them. You can fix that. Also, for some reason, when, when training a CNN on a regression task, uh, it was quite finicky. Um, so basically, you had to freeze parts of the backbone, maybe free the ba freeze the batch norm layers, maybe freeze the dropout, change the level of dropout. With the transformers, I didn't, I didn't see this making a difference. And I kind of forget, maybe the transformers don't use batch norm. Maybe they don't. They use these, that and drop out differently. But th th you didn't need, really need to freeze the transformers. Another very powerful technique was to actually train the body and the head separately. So a lot, instead of just taking one model with a head and just training it, uh, I was able to use um, NVIDIA's uh, support, support vector regression. So I actually would, I would train just the backbone uh, and then I, afterwards I would freeze the backbone and then put, put those embeddings into the support vector regression and have, a, uh, have SVR make the final prediction. And that was actually my most accurate CNN model was that. Uh, and there's a lot of alternatives to this, but the general idea is that you essentially, you know, you can kind of treat the backbone and the head separately. Um, and actually, if you look at the number one solution, so I actually trained my backbones, but if you look at the number one solution by Jibba, he didn't, uh, if I, I hope I'm not saying this incorrectly, I don't think he uh, even trained his backbones so he would actually just download the backbones, which were already pre-trained on the image nets. And then he just extract the embeddings. And then from there, um, he was able to take a betting might be, a, you know, a vector of a, a betting might be a thousand columns. It's, it's an, a vector of a thousand things. And from there, um, he also used uh, <clears throat> a rapid support vector regression, which has the ability to handle huge data. So he would take, you know, multiple models and extract embeddings from multiple models. Each of them themselves has a thousand columns, put them together. You're now talking about 10,000s of columns. And he would then just train all of that on a support on, you know, a single rapid support vector regression. And you can see the advantage here. So he would take embeddings out of a CNN. He would take embeddings out of a transformer. There's, you know, dozens of different transformers. He would take embeddings out of different transformers and each different model sees something different <clears throat> in the image. And each one of those different things it sees, it puts in a new column. So Jibba has this data, data frame with you know, tens of thousands of columns, which are coming from all these different models. <clears throat> and this is only using the pre-training from ImageNet. He didn't actually fine tune it further. And then you just train <clears throat> the Rapids uh, support vector regression on all of that. And it makes a prediction. And that actually achieved his highest uh, local CV. I think he got the CV down as low as 16.8, which is phenomenal. Uh, my model CV, my best CV only got as low as I think 16.999. So he got a full 0.2. And if you look at his final leaderboard placement, he was actually, he had a little bit of a lead uh, over the rest. Um, and I think it was really doing this. I think it was really, he basically... You know, it's a, it's a superior way to ensemble models. It's, it's a sort of a stacking approach. He didn't just take the predictions and average them. He essentially asked each model to tell us what are they observing in the images. And then he used all the models' observations about these images, all the features, and then makes a final score. Uh, and that was a, uh, with a single support vector regression. That, that was phenomenal. <clears throat> Uh, just wanted to point out for the audience. So this is from a paper by Zeller and Fergus and CNNs. And I'm not sure if it's the same for transformers. They learn different things at different stages. So I, I think what you were saying, Chris, uh, Jiba would extract intermediate uh, layers and put them into a model that goes into the SVR. Yeah, absolutely. And if you zoom in on that picture there on the right, I don't know if we have the ability to zoom in. 
but you can see how you know uh and then scroll up upwards for the people that are not familiar with that or yeah maybe you can't zoom in the later one okay <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, that's it. good so people that are not familiar with cnn's in that top left image there with layer one you see that the first layer of a cnn it's just looking for lines right You've got diagonal lines that go from the top right. You've got some vertical lines. It's also analyzing color. So a CNN basically said, you know, that's what a CNN does. It basically says, oh, I noticed there's a bunch of vertical lines. I noticed there's a bunch of patches of brown. I noticed there's a bunch of patches of white. So, and then <clears throat> that's layer one. And then the, the, the higher layers take combinations of those. You know, when I see a bunch of brown surrounded by a bunch of white, you know, I could tell it's a uh, it's an animal with, you know, a, a dual tone fur. And then so it basically it, it uses the lower features to combine them to make higher features. And then in the, at the end of the day, uh, and now when it basically you could think of it as saying like, yes or no, like, yes, I saw a brown present. No, I didn't see a brown present or yes. I saw, you know, two eyeballs facing the camera because it, it, it saw it essentially recognized circles by looking at lines. If the, if the cat was looking to the side, it didn't see eyeballs. So the, the model says, yes, I see eyeballs looking at the camera. The model says, you know, yes, I, I see this. So each of those columns sort of indicates, yes, I saw this. Yes, I saw this. Yes, I saw this. And then what the support vector regression does is based on what it did or did not see, it then makes a prediction. Oh, you saw the, you saw the animal was facing the camera? Oh, you saw it was this color. Oh, you saw it had ears. Oh, you saw this. In this case, people are going to click it. In this case, people won't. And, you know, he had 10,000 columns. That's a lot of information. And a support vector regression has many advantages. But one of them it does is it has built-in shrinkage, which is a feature selection. So by it won't be overwhelmed by all those columns. It'll basically, it'll, it'll, it'll actually utilize It'll, it'll choose the columns that it sees are most important. Um, and that's very helpful. So you give it all that information. It, it, it utilizes the important one and then makes a very accurate prediction. That makes sense. Uh, this, this is a question from the audience. Uh, do you tune the hyperparameters or do you follow any approach there? What's your strategy around hyperparameter tuning? So I, I tune some of them. Yeah. In general, uh, yeah, for each model, I'll pick a few to tune. Um, I'll, I'll I'll deem what I think are the most popular. You know, if we're talk if we're talking about you know a neural network, you know, learning rate is very popular. I, I like to analyze the batch size, um, the number of epochs, things like that. Uh, if we're talking about boosted trees, you know, maybe I'll just tune the depth of the tree. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll tune um, a subsample parameter, a feature subsample parameter. That's like three parameters. So personally, I think you should tune a few parameters. Uh, I'm not a huge advocate. You know, some people, they'll, they'll, they'll take a model like boosted trees and they'll tune, you know, 13 different parameters. I sort of think that's unnecessary because in the time to do that, you can just create a new feature to make your model more accurate or you can do something. So I would train a few that are important, you know, as I said. And then spend your time on other stuff. Spend your time on, you know, data augmentation. Spend your time on engineering new features. Spend your time on, you know, um, improving the model in other ways. Thank, thank you for that answer. Um, coming back to your solution, continuing from here, uh, you mentioned you put a SUR head on top of it and you explained the intuition behind it. Yeah, and I had mentioned how, so I just, I just put one SBR head per one model. And as I said, it was able to boost my CNN model to be, you know, my best CNN model. And then I, then I had mentioned how, how Jibba did something different. You know, he put one SVR head, he took multiple backbones and then sort of like a stacking approach pushed into one head. But yeah, I only did one head for one model. Jiba is a legend for a reason. Uh, I, I think yeah, in the yeah. Lexus competition you mentioned, he also shared a different approach that, uh, uh, you you were completely blown away by uh, absolutely you know absolutely and you know, I, I love working with him and other other Kaggle Grandmasters. so i've been working at nvidia now for two years and i'm on this team of Kaggle Grandmasters. masters and i'll say that i have learned so much you know jibba taught i i didn't actually understand targeting coding as, as well as i did before jibba actually explained it to me that was There's the one so you many, mentioned yeah exactly like there's so many more things I was unaware of. You have to you have to smooth the you have to smooth the target encoding. You actually have to apply it using a k-fold strategy. There's many many things, and that was actually 
you know, it was his idea using the target encoding in 2020, which won the Rexus comp. But he showed me that. I mean, he's a master at all things. He was top number one for so many years. And, and it's, you know, there's a, there's a reason for that. But yeah, I mean, you know, his solution, it's, it doesn't surprise me that he made a beautifully stacked model. That's, that's, that's his thing. He can combine tons of models and not overfit. And that's what he did here. You know, he stacked the SVR on top of many models. And that's, and that's actually sort of what target encoding is. Target encoding is actually, is actually a model in and of itself. When you take, when you, when you target encode, you're essentially building a little model called a target encoding model. That's why you need to be very careful. And then when you use that as a feature in your other model, you're essentially stacking on top of it. That's why it's super important to be careful to do target encoding using folds and smoothing, et cetera, because you're essentially stacking. And whenever you stack, you have to be careful not to leak. It's very complicated with, with, with validation. You have to be careful not to leak. You can't, you know, use, you can't use a target um, to, you know, modify the, the same row, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but yeah, he, he, he knows how to do that. And, and he, sh he showed another, he showed it again in, in this comp. Sorry for continuously going on tangents and distracting you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we scroll down. So that was the CNN. So I, I, I also, you know, did a bunch of image, image transformers. And uh, again, I, I say I, I started with some wonderful public notebooks. I actually started with the, uh, the I Love Sciences uh, Fast AI notebook. It's fantastic. I think it was wonderful because it, it's so quick. It allowed people to, to, dump, to jump in so quickly. Uh, Fast AI is supported with the, with the TIM repository. So if you want to try out a different model, you just change one word. That's it. One word. You know, instead of using SWIN 224 um, large, you know, you could just, you could change, you can use this other transform that's BIT. And what's really cool, I say it right here, but um, so, you know, uh, if you import Tim and then you write Tim list models, pre-trained equals true, it gives you a list and Tim is fantastic. Tim you have to list. scroll a lot. Oh <laughs> you, yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know, a thousand models. There's just too many models, right? But it's awesome. He's got, he, as soon as, I mean, he's got models that have just been released a you know, within the last month, he's, he's, uh, he keeps it super, super up to date. Um, you know, he, I think he does a lot of the pre-training himself or he finds pre-training. Look already, look at this already. He's, he's next adding, is already uh, there. yeah, Cobb next. I mean, it just came out. He's already adding it. And then what does that mean for us for the end user? That means we just change one word, you know, we have some code and then we just change import Cobb. We just change, you know, import swim to import Cobb next. And then, uh, you know, fast AI is nice. Basically, the rest of the pipeline is pretty robust. It can self adjust. It could pick a learning rate. It could pick a learning rate. Um, as I said, it it, it did a, a, a bunch of other things. So you could try all these different transformers by changing one word. And once you once you get the CV to print out correctly, you can just see what's good. And I did this. You know, as I said, every, you know, the comp was three months. Every night, every night. I had some extra GPUs. <laughs> I would just change the word. I would I'd change the word and I would uh, keep notes here. And, you know, I was super excited the morning I woke up with the BIT. So that the BIT transformer, it actually, it, it's, uh, its novelty is the way it's pre-trained. So it's actually has a, sem, a semi super, it has a, um, an unsupervised way of pre-training training, the same way you pre-train BERT, but you show it images then you hide parts of the images and then you sort of ask the model to, to generate those parts of the images. So it has a, uh, it's quite diverse pre-training from other transformers. And as such, you know, it was one of my best CV scores, but I should say this, this is very, very important to people. If you're building an ensemble, so if you chose early on that ensemble is your approach because of reasons we discussed, it's not so important the, the CV score of an individual model. That's not, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is, yeah, so here's the, the <clears throat> describing some of the, the model and the pre-training. So the most important thing when you're building an ensemble, it's not how accurate is the new model. The most important thing is, let me add it to my existing mo collection of models and let me see if the addition improves the overall CV, right? So for instance, the VIT transformer, VIT transformer, it had, a it had a great CV score. I added it to my collection of models. The CV score got worse. So yeah, the VIT was doing good by itself, 
But did the VIT add diversity to the models? No, it mm. didn't. It means the other models were already up, the, the other models were already seeing whatever the VIT saw. Now, let's talk about the 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 bit, the BEIT. Um, this model again had a good CV score. I added it to the ensemble, and then boom, uh, the CV score you know improved 0.1. I was like, whoa! So there you have it. That's the hill climbing for you. When you build an ensemble. Um, and frequently, you know, this will su surprise people. You might build a model that has a terrible CV. This happened in a, um, in a in melanoma comp. Somebody made a tabular model just from metadata. The CV was terrible. However, you add it to an ensemble and it shot the, it improved the CV so much. The point is the new model has to have information that the ensemble doesn't. So if the new model uses new features, has a new type of pre-training, maybe has access to new types of metadata, maybe it was trained in a new way, maybe it was trained um, with new types of augmentation, the new model does something different. And it has a new perspective on what the prediction should be. And then you add it to your other models. And when I say add it, I don't mean give it, you know, 1%. I mean, you know, add it. If, you've, if you already have five models, then you know, add it as a six model and add them all up and divide by six. You know, add it in pretty significantly and let's see, does it help your CV score or hurt your CV score? And I added the BIT one morning, it bumped my score. And actually, believe it or not, I made a submission to the leaderboard and it bumped me the same much on leaderboard. So, you know, people said things like CV and leaderboard didn't correlate, but for the most part, um, I would say, you know, 80% of the things that were helping me locally. I would then submit to the leaderboard and they helped me. There was still, you know, 20% mystery. Some things that didn't help me on local CV, I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll add it to my LB ensemble and I'll submit it. And I did an improved leaderboard. So there were some models that I had two ensembles. I had my, my, my local CV ensemble and I only added models which helped it. And then I had a collection of models called my LB, my best LB ensemble. And the same way, I would add a new model and then I would submit it to the leaderboard. So I was basically building two subsets of models and they became different. The dense net and the uh, inception models, they helped the leaderboard. They did not help uh, my CV model. I just kept my two collections different. And then those are my, yeah, you see these are my two collections. And those are my, those are my final um, two submissions. You can see, actually keep right here. You can see something I did right here. I did this, this was the last night when I pulled the all-nighter. You can look at my <laughs> best CV model. I've got the Covnex 384 with the dog cat auxiliary output. Super excited about this. So I tried a lot to use the metadata in this competition. I wasn't able to actually get any benefit using the met metadata. Um, there was someone who posted a, uh, uh, a data set and I think he mostly maybe hand labeled every image in the training data, whether it was a dog or cat, or maybe he used the model. But I think he said he confirmed it by looking, visually inspecting them. So I actually, what I did was I gave that as an auxiliary training task. So the thing is, here's an, a nice trick that people can use. If you have information about your training data that you do not have for the test data, well, you could still use that to help training, but you don't add it as an input because we won't have it for the test data to input. So what you do is you use it as an output. So when you train your model, you train your model to predict two things. Your model will predict um, the popularity, which is the probability of click, and your model also predicts whether it's a cat or a dog. And, you and then you can do a regression or just back propagate through that since you have the labels for that. Well, exactly. So I actually, I use two different losses. So they're both back propagated separately. So you, 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 know, you, you calculate the popularity score and you back propagate that error and you calculate dog and cat and you back propagate that. And this is analogous to many things in life, right? If you're trying to you know, be a better tennis player, maybe you train someone to, hey, go ahead and every once in a while, take three balls and just juggle them with your hands. I mean, you, you teach somebody to do a new task and you know, different tasks can still help. And um, you try this out and sure enough, when I added the dog cat as an auxiliary output, it boosted the CV a little bit, but even more significantly, like I said earlier, when I added it to the ensemble, it boosted the ensemble. The point is it's a different model, right? It's the model was trained to 
be looking at the animal. Maybe the other model didn't, but this model was looking. Is it a dog? Is it a cat? Is it a dog? So the model was diverse. And then when I added it to the ensemble, it boosted the score. And that, that model boosted both the CV and the LB. And I discovered it either the last night, maybe it was the second to last night um, before the comp ended. Um, I don't like to work last second, but um, I did it. <laughs> it improved the models and I, I, I had time to, time to include it. That makes sense. Uh, I can only imagine the adrenaline rush you would be having at that point. Um, awesome. I think only this portion is left things that didn't work. Uh, yeah. So one thing I tried very often was, you know, we had tons of data from last year's comp, which means, you know, we had, I forget, was it thousands of thousands of, of more pet images? So I thought surely, um, you know, somehow this should be able to improve the model because Fundamentally, the model, it needs to look at images of, of, of animals. So the more images you can show it, even if they have different labels, could help. And the idea, one of the ideas, the way you do this is you would pre-train it. So you do this. You take your model and you first show it all the images from last year's comp. And you train it with a, with, you put a head on the model, which predicts the last year's comp target, which was different than this year's comp. Last year's comp target it was something else. And you train it with that and you back propagate the error. And what it does is it affects all the layers of the neural network. And those are the layers which are basically extracting features like, you know, is it a dog? Is it a cat? Are the eyeballs? So it actually changes what it looks for. Okay. After you do that, you stop the training, you remove the head, and now you put a new head on the model. And now you train it with this year's competition data and this year's target. This is the whole idea behind um, pre-training, the whole idea behind the Tim repository. They've been pre-trained on ImageNet, which is tens of millions of images. And it has a benefit to us because by just letting the model look at images, the model will just learn to understand what is in an image. Images have color, images have lines, images have shapes, right? You just train your model to recognize basic things. So I thought that surely that this could help the model by showing it some more dogs and cats. Unfortunately, it didn't. I tried things like pseudo labeling, which is, you know, you take, you take the images from last year, you, uh, you predict some labels, uh, popularity scores on last year, you then just add it, and then it's not pre-training anymore. Then you could just combine it with the training data and just train it on through. That didn't help. Um, I, tried, I tried taking last year's models that have already, you know, won the comp and then using those models to predict on this year's comp and, and then basically for each this year's image, you know, add a new column of features, use those features. So I tried many, many things. Uh, in the end, I couldn't get anything to work. So I didn't, I didn't use a, uh, last year's data at all. And then when I read all the winning solutions, uh, I actually see that in the top six finalists, uh, so f uh, three of them actually were able to use last year's comp in a successful fashion. So I did not... A uh, jib at first place did not. I forget some other team did not. Maybe third place, but then a uh, uh, Anadero, uh, the other uh, KG Mana and Nvidia, he was able to successfully use his, his team. His team and him, his team was able to successfully year, use last year's comps. As were two other people, and the way they used it was this: quite creative. Uh, I wish I discovered it, so I didn't even notice this. But it turns out that. There was actually some, so one third of the images this year, those same exact images were in a previous comp. So what you actually do is you build a model which actually finds those similar images. And every time an image in this comp existed previously, you add the metadata. And the metadata was stuff like what breed is the animal? The metadata was stuff like how long did it take for the animal to be adopted? The metadata was stuff like, um, I don't know, but basically it's, it was actually powerful <laughs> metadata. It wasn't, this year the metadata was like, is the animal looking at the camera? I would say that's weak because the model can already determine that. But there was some things last year, for instance, adoption speed. Um, I mean, that's a pretty powerful meta feature. So what they what, what some of the top teams did was, for the one third of images this year, which were the same as last year, they ran it through a sort of a similarity model. They found them, even during inference, they found the similar images. They took the metadata from last year, they concatenated it onto this year. And then for that one third of data, 
they use this special model that utilize the extra features. So for the other two thirds of inference, they just, you know, use their typical models. But then for that one third of images, they had some additional information and they had trained additional models and they said it gave them a pretty big boost. However, it's, de it's clear that it gave a boost in local CV score. It's clear that it gave a boost in leader public leaderboard score because that was actually the reason that many teams were high on public leaderboard. But I'm actually not sure if it has been confirmed on private leaderboard um, because surprisingly, if you look at the three teams that used metadata from last year and then the three teams that did not, all among the top six, all of their final private leaderboard scores are the same. So I think it may be the case that maybe the private images, maybe there was no overlap. You know, no one's really confirmed this. Maybe there was actually no overlap between the private images because I would think that the teams that used it would maybe have jumped higher if they didn't. So maybe in the end, you know, it helped on public, but maybe maybe in the end, uh, using that meta actually didn't help on private. I think that's still to be determined. Awesome. Um, I think we've covered the solution, so we can move on to the audience questions. Any anything you wanted to add for, from the solution? Sorry, uh, anything remaining from the solution that we? Oh might have no, no, I, 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 no, I, I, uh, I'm happy. We we, we covered that. We covered the solution. Thanks. Thanks for the comprehensive overview. Um, there's a question by I think it's he's Osif, uh on Kaggle. He's also a grandmaster, I believe. Uh, were you varying the losses on the output uh, between the auxiliary and uh, regular output? Um, so I did not tune it. P perhaps if I did tune it, I could have got better performance. But off the bat, um, off the bat, I just basically added it. So one, the uh, the class. So I for the predicting dog and cat, I just added a BCE loss, and then per for predicting. Oh, so actually they're both BCE losses. Because So what people were doing this, even though this comp was a regression comp, um, so I added it to the Covnex, which was, which was the image transformer. For, the, for that particular image transformer, um, the popularity score I was predicting with a BCE loss. So actually I was predicting a BCE loss and then afterwards rescaling it to re the regression values between a zero and hundred. So essentially I had two BCE losses, one for popularity, one for dog cat, and I just weighted them 50-50. That makes sense. Yeah, and um, I want to thank I want to thank Osifer. I used a, I, I used he he contributed a lot of public notebooks and discussions. We early we talked about grad cam. I want to give the shout out to him. I think he was the first one to publish the the difference between grad cam between uh, the CNN and the image transformer and how one focuses on the face and the body. And he he pub, he he shared a lot of yeah he he shared a lot of discussion posts. He actually did a lot of analysis uh, comparing using classification loss. Uh, versus using regression loss. He did a lot of comparison, comparing CNNs versus transformers. And actually it really motivated the, the direction I took early on. I kind of took a lot of things he said uh, and I really dove. So, you know, he had come to some conclusions that uh, using these losses and these models, and that was kind of the first things I investigated. So shout out to that. And he had, he showed some code uh, training some VIT models. I was using that in the beginning. In, in the end, my in the end though, um, as I found new transformers, um, the, the vits I ended up removing them, but I, uh, I used his work a lot and, and appreciate it. Also, is absolutely incredible. Thanks for joining us live. Also, um, there's another question. Uh, why do you think SVR worked better uh, compared to just using gradient descent in the original hit? Great question. So this is actually the, the second time I, I've done this SVR trick. It actually I used it in the common lit. Uh, competition, which was a, uh, it was an NLP regression task. And now this is the second time using it in this competition. Um, and in each competition that gave a slight boost, um, if I looked at my solution with and without it, I can clearly see that it, it increased me a couple of ranks. Why it works, I think a few reasons. So first of all, there are other, there are, I will start out by saying there are other, there are other options. Uh, for instance, in common lit, people are using this thing called Bayesian Ridge, which actually worked very, very good. Um, so, you know, there are other options. Uh, I think the reason that SVR uh, works great and the reason Bayesian Ridge works great is both Ridge and SVR have an inherent. Um, uh, so Ridge uh, has an uh, basically they, they both have an inherent uh, feature reduction built in. So Ridge. Uh, 
so they both try to remove features. So it's not the so just ordinary regression wouldn't, but you have lasso regression, you've got ridge regression. These are types of aggression and S and SV, SVR regression. These are types of aggression that during the training process, they try to remove features. And what you have here is if you look at the embeddings from a neural network, it's really a lot of features. There's thousands of features. And then if you do it, Jibba did and combine them. So that's like so many features. And a lot of them are kind of not needed. So I think it's really important to use some type of ridge, lasso, uh, a shrinkage like SVR has to kind of really remove a lot of those. Uh, and that makes your model, you know, generalize better. And there are other approaches, you know, you can build a neural network head. And I think you, I think you can actually apply different um, losses. Like you can add an, an L2 or L1 loss that actually prunes and actually kind of removes features from a neural network head. Uh, I think some optimizers, maybe Adam W does this. So there's a lot of alternatives, but I think a powerful thing is one to, you know, uh, prevent overfitting and make your model generalized by essentially reducing the number of features. And then two, something that I've seen both uh, in the common lit comp and the pet finder comp was this weird phenomenon where if you try to tra train the backbone and head all at once in the regression task, you didn't get as good results as training them separately. And you can train them separately in different ways. One way is to just use different, different um, learning rates uh, at, for different layers. And another way is just straight up freezing. So, you know, you first freeze the head and train the backbone and then, you know, and then you freeze the backbone and unfreeze the head. So the whole discussion about using SVR or using Bayesian Ridge or using whatever, it's sort of, it also has the advantage of, of training the backbone and head separately. You know, you, you train the backbone some way and then you freeze the backbone and then you're then training a head. And um, I think that's why, for those two reasons, I think that's why it is powerful. And, well, and, there's the, and I guess now if you want to speak, and then so that's why SVR is powerful. Now, if you want to say why was Rapids powerful, so Rapids runs on GPU, which makes it faster than other forms of SVR. And the advantage there is what this speed allows you to do is you can handle more features. So for instance, what, so in my situation, you know, I probably could have done it on CPU because I only had, you know, ahead for one model. But what Jiva did, when Jiva combined the embeddings of multiple models, he's now looking at tens of thousands of features. And I haven't tried it, but I think if you try to, if you try to train, you know, a GPU based SVR or a GPU, uh, sorry, if you try to train a CPU version of anything, um, I think it's going to be uh, maybe too slow to actually be able to train with, with so many columns. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks for the clarification and elaborate answer. We're out of schedule time. Is it okay if I go five minutes over? I just have three more questions. Yeah, yeah, it's fine for me. Um, random question. If uh, you were to pick your favorite model in the world of machine learning, just one model, which one would it be? <laughs> favorite algorithm or model? Probably a neural network. I feel like... Uh... I guess when I when I work with a neural network and I train a neural network, I feel more like a teacher. As I, I feel behavior a little unexpected. It's like what you did. It might learn things you don't. It, it's it's more of a black box. It's more unsure what it's learning. It, it's sort of trickier. It's more of an art form. So I, I kind of like it. And and a lot of times the results surprise you. Uh, and I've always been. I think I've always been kind of drawn to uh, types of neural networks. I mean, my other favorite is boosted trees, but I like neural networks. Okay. Uh, you don't have to answer this one, uh, but you're uh, many people's favorite Kagler. Uh, do you have any Kagler to whom you really look up to? Um, so, I mean, as you said earlier, you know, I, I engage discussion with everybody. So I really follow everybody. People will be surprised. Um, how much I, I, I so I, yeah, on my, on my, on my, if you go to my profile, I haven't actually checked off who I'm following. Uh, the reason is I don't need notifications. I just read everything, right? There's a lot of people I keep an eye on. So a lot of Kagglers, I'll, I'll frequently look at leaderboards just to see what competitions people are participating in. You know, all my former teammates, I follow them. I kind of see, oh, what are they up to, you know, nowadays? I've teamed with a lot, huge variety of people. I'm always keeping an eye, you know, what comps are they in? Um, what are they doing? I'm reading their discussion posts. I'm, I'm, you know, of course, always reading the work of the greats. But then, as you mentioned earlier, 
I read all the discussions, even of, of the new Kaglers, the people with, you know, the questions. Um, I really like to kind of keep an eye on all of it because I feel that there's uh, something to learn from all of it. Your, your passion really comes through. <laughs> we, we're all grateful for it. Um, uh, this is another stupid question, uh, but you've been very kind to me with uh, always agreeing to my request. Uh, this is a greedy question. What's what's one thing you want me to improve on in the series where I interview my favorite Kaglias? A- any feedback for me? Well, any so critical it feedback? Like it, so it looks like you're already making changes because this is nice. So I I really like your 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 sort of changing your format now to kind of dive a little bit more into <laughs> more specifics of the solution which are providing, you know, more opportunities to sort of share the code, share the algorithms, dive into the science. So that's great. There's not many things I'd change. I mean, I, when I, when I, you know, before the show, I told you how you're my, you're my favorite uh, host and you are, you have a great personality. Um, your, your, your shows, you cover a, a, a huge variety of things. I think that you, you ask good questions. Um, you, you, you're also like me, you're excited, your, your, your passion shows through, that makes for a good discussion between us. But so, Chris, I'm, I'm looking for critical feedback. <laughs> I didn't ask this just because I wanted <laughs> encouragement from you. I sincerely want some critical feedback, if any. Hi, let me think, let me think. Um, <laughs> nah, nothing comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, with that, I, I, I'd love to wrap up because we've gone over time. Uh, everyone, please find Chris on Kaggle. He lives on there. Practically, you can find him on any discussion post. He's super engaging uh, like he was in this interview. Uh, you can ask him any question on there. And from what I've understood, he always replies to any question. So that's the best way to connect with him. Uh, he also has social media profiles, but I've never seen any posts there, so I won't point them out. <laughs> uh, Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much again, Chris. And thank you so much, uh, audience, for joining us live and for following the entire interview. Thanks so much once again for inviting me. And thank you, audience, for, for watching and participating. <laughs>